Hey, hey, Caleb, will you pull that one curtain just close right there for me? Thank you, buddy. <clears throat> All right. Well, good evening. We get back into the Psalms tonight. <clears throat> Psalm 3 and 4. I'm battling a brutal cold right now, so if you'd just keep me in prayer, I'd appreciate that. But Father, we come this evening, and Lord, we fall on your grace, because you are a God that is worthy to be praised. Of all honor and glory and praise to your name, Lord Jesus. And as we read the Psalms, and as it proclaims a, a Messiah, kingdom of David. We are a people that's blessed to know. As John the Baptist proclaimed, all the other prophets said, he's coming, and John said, he's here. So what we read in the Psalms, Lord, as you tell us in Luke chapter 24, that everything written in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning you, Lord Jesus, must be fulfilled. And so as we read this amazing book, this hymn book, this song book, we're reminded that we sing praise and honor and glory to you, God, because you are worthy to be praised and honored in this place. Part of our prayer life, Lord, is just praying even your word back to you, God, trusting you, it being sown into our hearts, and then saying, God, this is what you said, and I know that you're going to come through. And we grow in our relationship with you. We grow in our faith with you. Because we're proclaiming your word. We're singing your word. We're meditating on it. The law of the Lord day and night. And it guides us. It changes us, Lord. It molds us to be more like you. And our desire tonight, Lord, is to be more like you. Because that's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. That's your perfect will, making us more into the image of Jesus today than we were yesterday. And so we pray as we walk out of here tonight that we didn't just hear a sermon. We didn't just hear a Bible teaching. That we got an orthodoxy, a right doctrine. But it leads us to an orthopraxy. And that's a right practice in living of the things that are spoken into our lives and your songs will do that for us. And we know there's lamentations. We know there's blessings. We know there's the Psalms of Ascent, the imprecatory Psalms, some anonymous, some from David, and then others along the way. But tonight, God, we've come to worship you and to bow down before you with our praise and our honor and our glory that's due unto your name, Lord Jesus. Receive our worship tonight. Receive our worship tonight, Lord. Speak deeply to our hearts, each one of us, Lord, speak deeply. Uniquely, but speak deeply to our hearts. We love you, Lord, but it's simply because you first loved us. Thank you for sending a Shua for sinners like us, that we could be once again reunited in peace and in right relationship with our God, to know you, the power of your resurrection, and the love that you pour out. So lead us and guide us here tonight, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Rion. Test. We're working on it. Test, test, we on? Test, there we go. All right. So tonight we'll be back in the Psalms. Um, last week, uh, Brian did an introduction. I really, uh, I believe Pastor Brian would like to be up here tonight speaking on the Psalms, but uh, I get the privilege of doing that. I really appreciate it. Let, let's pray here before we start. Father, thank you so much, God, for your spirit. Lord, thank you for the promises in your word. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in you. God, would you just prepare our hearts to, to receive and hear what you have for us tonight in, in Psalm 2 and 3. Lord, they're, they're, they're beautiful psalms. Lord, they, they show us the heart of David. More than that, Lord, they show us your heart. And just speak to us, Lord. Maybe take away something here, God, that we can apply to our life, Lord. We're not here just to, to hear a Bible study, Lord, or just to show up to church, Lord. But we want to hear a word from you here tonight. So help me to get out of the way and let you speak to our hearts. And, and I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Brian brought in last week that this book is full of... Um, I guess he took us at, to the Bible Project. He showed us a little video about this Tim Mackey. And the um, guy has a lot of insight into Scripture. And when you look at the Scriptures, what we're going to look at tonight, there's lamentation in the Scriptures, and then there's praise in the Scriptures. We're seeing a man with a heavy heart, and that, yet we're seeing him looking to God and, and, and praising him. And that's a lot, of, a lot of times that's the way it is with our life. There's a lot of things in this life we, we lament over. We, we carry heavy burdens and they hold us down. I mean, we go through different trials. One day's not like the next. They're all different. Some are easier than others. If, if you're not in a trial right now and things are going good, praise God because you will be in a trial because the scriptures say the trials of the righteous are many and we're going to be in them. And I just uh, appreciate David's heart. David used to be one of my favorite Bible characters besides Jesus. And it was because of his heart, the heart that he had for God. You know, as we've been going through the Old Testament, you know, we see Moses, we're seeing different people in there, Joshua. We're seeing other people, Joseph, who just just had a passion for God. And you know something, I, I get a more of appreciation when I see someone who's following God. And, and that's today, too. Uh, if you're here tonight, you're here because you want to hear a word from the Lord. You want to grow in your relationship with God. And that's what God wants for us. That's a good thing, isn't it? God wants that for us. So David always, he messed up a lot. I, I talked with some brothers uh, before, and they've just told me how David just lived a messy life. And I'm so thankful for that example, because even though he lived a messy life, he brought his mess before the Lord, and he let God clean it up. And, and you know, there were consequences sometimes to his sin, and uh, but even besides all that, he never took his eyes off the Lord. He always kept his eyes on the Lord. He knew where his strength was. He knew where his hope was. And again, last week, um, God's encouraging us. You know, he said, blessed is the man who, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. He says, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but it says his delight is in the law of the Lord. So if we're here tonight, our delight is in the word of God. And I remember as a young Christian, I couldn't get enough of it. I couldn't sit in enough Bible studies. I couldn't listen to enough Bible tapes. Uh, of course, I guess today it would be CDs or just plain old online studies, right? But I couldn't get enough. I just kept. Fe I just wanted more. I wanted more. I wanted more of God. And that's what David does. David wants more and more of God. And you know, as you seek the Lord, he begins to reveal himself to you. That's going to come out in the Psalms tonight. Um, I'm just amazing. You know, James says, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. God wants us. He made us to seek him, to look for him. He's picked this time for us to be here, our, our, where we live. He's chosen that. And his hope for us is that we would grope for him and find him. And he says he's not far from us. He's just a prayer away from us. The only thing that can keep us away from God is our pride, thinking that we are better and have a better plan than he does. And I'm so glad for his grace, because that was me at one time for sure. So tonight, um, I guess we have five, 
five, this is broken down into five separate books here. And last, last week he did the introduction with the first uh, two chapters, and I guess we have the last five chapters at, as a summary to the Psalms. But tonight we're going to begin with a Psalm 3, and it's going to talk about God being, um, God being his, his protection, the one who watches over him. And I, I can relate to David. I, I, just, I just relate to him so much. I mean, I, I see what he does, um, especially here tonight, this particular psalm, uh, talking about a time in his life when he had his son Absalom. He was chasing after him. He had, he had taken, he had snuck behind his back. He got in favor with the people. He took his throne from his dad. Now he's chasing him to kill him. You've got to think, David's here. He's got, he's running from his son. His son has his military and a lot of his advisors on his side. He probably had trained them. He's outnumbered. There's just a numerous amount of, of, of enemies against him or friends at one time are now enemies coming after him to kill him and wipe him out. I don't know about you, but my son was seeking after me to kill me with an army. That would devastate me. And yet through all that, David had a love and a passion for Absalom. And that's God's heart for us. I, I think of the scripture when God says he loved us when we were yet sinners. It just blows me away. He loved me when I was living in my sin calling out to me, offering his mercy and his grace. Just amazing what God does. But, but David understood this. And Dave, none of us are ever beyond God's help. That's right. None of us. I mean, God's just a prayer away. But this man, David, is running for his life. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures here before we get into this, kind of set the tone here. 2 Samuel 15, 13 here says... Now a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Basically what he's hearing here is that everyone's turned against you. Wow. This is how he felt. Everybody had turned against you and they've given their heart over to Absalom. He probably felt abandoned. Here's a king. I mean, David's a mighty warrior. I mean, he, was, he fought Goliath, you know, and when he was a shepherd, he, he went and he turned away from a, killed a lion and a bear to protect his sheep. Um, I mean, he never went after Saul. He, he had opportunity to kill the man who was chasing him. Is, here he goes again, another man trying to kill him for no reason. For no reason at all because he was doing what God had called him to do. I'm going to read um, 2 Samuel 16, just 5 and 8 to give a little more of a perspective here what's going on. Again, it says here, um, Now when King David came to Bahrum, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. Coming from there, he came out cursing continuously as he came. And it says, he threw stones at David and all the servants of the king David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Also, Shimei said thus when he cursed out, he says, come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. Here he is leaving, and this man comes out, and obviously some of his men want to come up and kill this man. He says, no, maybe God has put this man out there. David's feeling like, hey, maybe there's some truth to this. And we know, obviously, that wasn't the truth as we read on through the scriptures, but he's just... Everything's coming against him. Um, even, even, you know, things can go good for a while. I, I personally did, had a rough couple of weeks, and I understand that, you know, you can plan your ways, but the Lord directs your steps. And you know where they all lead? They all lead right back to him. I mean, you can be struggling with things, trying to figure things out, but unless you take them to the Lord, and that's one of the things I appreciate about David is that he took everything to the Lord. Even when he went out to fight his enemies, what did he do? He prayed about it. He never lost a battle. Because he prayed about all of his battles. I don't think he prayed about Bathsheba. But uh, obviously he didn't because it led him into sin. But, there were, but most of the things that that man did, he prayed about it. And God answered his prayers. Even with Bathsheba, he prayed and repented. And God received him. And he let him know that. So David was a man of prayer. I like to pray. I'm a needy person. David was a needy person. And I think we, that's a good place to be. God wants us to be humble before him, and we all know that. He, you know, he gives grace to the humble. I want all the grace I can get, but he resists the proud. When I'm proud and arrogant, he, he stands up 
I mean, he, he resists me, and I don't want that. I, I want to have that relationship with God that he wants to have with me. So again, this is what David's thinking. He's probably downcast. He's running for his life. And I, I can only imagine. He says, here I go again. Here we are, you know, another person coming after me. And this one's my son, whom I deeply love. Let's go look at Psalm 3 to start with uh, verse 1. First thing that comes up is, is Lord. How they have increased who trouble me. One of the things that David recognized is that God was, was Lord. Is Yahweh. He, 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 he knew who he was. He knew his God. And God wants us to know him. I, I'm still learning about him. The more I know about God, the greater he becomes. I, I hope that's the same way with you. The more we learn about the scriptures and God and his character, just the greater he becomes. And hopefully that, that gives us an awe of him and, and lets us have, you know, just appreciate him for who he is. And, you know, he, he, he addresses him. He honors him, gives him reverence. And, and, and we need to do that, too. We need to realize who we're coming before when we pray. We're not just haphazardly coming before him. We're coming before the creator of the universe, our maker. And, and again, he, we see this reverence here for him. He says, how they have increased who trouble me. He's feeling that people are not just some things, but his trials and troubles are getting worse and worse. And they're just starting to pile up. You know, sometimes there comes a point in our life when we just feel like giving up. It happens. It's happened probably. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to you guys. Sometimes it just is overwhelming. And he's going to show us what he does here. He's going to, again, bring these things to the Lord. Um, he says, many are those who rise up against me. Sometimes it, it just seems overwhelming. When it, when it rains, it pours. Is that it's not a biblical saying for sure, but doesn't it feel like that? Something goes wrong. Next thing you know, something else is going wrong. Next thing you know, we just don't know what to do with it. And it's not, not, a, not the best place we want to be. So again, he's feeling this way, and verse 2 says, many are those who say, say of me. Okay, he's talking about, again, many, many. He's feeling overwhelmed. You know, if you have one problem, that's one thing, but when you have many problems or many things stacking up against you, it doesn't take a whole lot to overwhelm us either. It helps us to know how fragile we are. And uh, sometimes things just get to you. You can be in the wrong mood. It, it can be a family member. It can be your health can go south financially. You could be ruined. It could be your job. You just never know what's going to come your way. And, and, you know, one thing for sure, though, is God knows what's happening in our place. And if, it's, if God's allowing these things to happen in our life, it should draw us to him to seek his will. And as we seek his will, it seems like these things start going away. But when you don't seek the Lord, it, almost, it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it compounds itself. It's not a good place to be for sure. He says, many of those who say of me, again, He's talking about himself. When we, when we talk about other people, we have to remember that we are made in the image of God. God made us to be in his image. He made every one of us here in his image. The problem is, is that we're corrupted by sin. And who gives us the right, again, um, you know, to put somebody else down or to talk about somebody else. And here, he's, these people, are t friends of his, were talking about him. He's not only talking behind his back, they were talking to his face, as we just heard. And it was just, it was a lot for him. It was a lot for him to take. We don't like to have people come up to us and put us down. I mean, it's, 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 we're supposed to be building one another up as believers, right? And again, he's still feeling dejected, re rejected. He says, there's no help for him, he says, in God. I mean, we're living souls. We're, we're unique in all God's creation He's given us a soul. I, I look at you guys just out here, and I, I'm just thinking, look at all the personalities that are here. Isn't God creative? We're all unique. We're wonderfully and fearfully made, but we're unique. And, and God's given us gifts, and we have different characters. You know, we might be similar to someone in some ways. Even if you're twins, you're different, you know. But, but God has made us that way. And he's just, again, he, he's, he's sitting here. He's needing some encouragement. Um, you know who rejects God? It's his enemies. And, and again, David had accepted God, and these people here, if they were rejecting God's authority that God had put over him, they're rejecting God too. I mean, God had placed him in that position. God, David even recognized that Saul was placed in that position by God, and he honored him. He didn't dishonor him. He honored him until God took his life. 
We see something here, this, this sila. Um, it's mentioned 70 times, over 70 times, I think, in the Psalms. Uh, if any of you have a definition for this, I'd like to hear it. Maybe it's a, a, it's, it's a pause. Nobody that I saw really gave an accurate definition of what it was. Jeff's got one there, I'm sure. It's a good one. Yeah, amen or a pause, maybe a pause to sit there and meditate on what it is. I've, I've heard that explanation too given, but there's nothing really for sure here, but it's used over and over again. Obviously, it's, it's, there's a purpose and a plan for that. I just really didn't find just one specific one that matched that, but we're going to hear that over and over again. To set the stage here for, for verse 3, I'm going to look at Job. Um, Job's another godly man. Job was a man that God, he, I mean, his wife said, curse God and die. I mean, that, that's about how far along he was. He was, took his health, his riches, his family, everything he had was taken away from him. But he says here, Job in chapter um, 19, um, starting here with verse 25. I'm just going to read a couple, three verses. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job yearned to see God. David yearned to see God. We're going to see this here in, in verse 3. Do you yearn? Do you desire to see God? I want to see him in his glory. I can't wait to see him. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll fall on my face. Even when men see angels, they fall on their face in scripture. But I want to see him in his glory. And I'm looking forward to it. And I'm longing for it. Uh, it'll happen soon enough. If he doesn't come and get us, we're going to, we're going to go to be with him for sure. He says here, but you, O Lord, verse 3, are a shield for me. Uh, again, you are God is our shield. He's our protection. Uh, a shield can be used for offensive or defensive here, but here he's in a place where he feels like he's being attacked and he's bringing God up as being his defense. And he's your defense. No matter where you're at or what, what you're into, God's your defense. And if you're a believer in Christ, he'll stand up for you and he'll get you through. He says here, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. Now, isn't, isn't that that's just amazing? He's our glory. He is. Uh, and he's going to share that with us one day. He's going to share everything he has with us one day. And I can't wait. It says, I hasn't seen or ear heard what God has for those who love him. I don't know if that it gives you goosebumps. I mean, you know, he, he's revealed some of these things to us, but we still don't have a clear, full picture of that. And he says here that, that he, he lifts up my head. Again, he, he, he's his support. He's his strength. God's his strength. When we're weak, the Bible says that he's strong. In our weakness, God shows his strength to us. And David understood that, I think, more than anybody. In his weakest moments, in his most down moments, he relied on trusted in the Lord to bring him through. Second uh, Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're being transformed. Everything that we go through, we process the scripture, it calls it sanctification. But we're being changed more and more into the image of Christ. These trials that God takes us through, the victories that he gives us in those trials, brings God glory. The things that we go through in life, the troubles we go through in life, when we're trusting in the Lord to bring us through, it brings him glory. And again, he's changing us. So hopefully when we go through tough times and, and trials that we thank God for them. Because again, that, that's part of the process if you're growing. You don't heat something up, you don't purify it. He's just removing things, sin from our life. And again, he's growing our faith and our trust in him. I'm really thankful for that. So again, a shield. What is God displaying himself as? As a protection. God is our protection. He's our shield. And if you'll depend upon him to protect you during the tough times in life, he'll be faithful to come through for you. And again, we just read his glory through us going through the trials. When we have victory, we're growing in our faith. We're seeing God working in our life. David prayed a lot, and he got to see God working in his life. Hopefully, we're men and women of prayer, especially when we go through trials. And then we get to see God answering prayer. 
you know, I look at the Psalms, it's kind of like David's writing a journal here for us, that he's given us insight into his life and he's putting these things down there, these nuggets, so we can have them. And I've encouraged a lot of our kids with the youth that, to start journaling. Start journaling, start putting your, um, I, I gave them some of these little moleskin booklets I have and said, start writing your prayers down so you can read them and see how many prayers that God has actually answered. I, we're in the process of moving right now. I had a whole stack of journals. I started reading them and I had to shake my head. Did I really write that? couldn't believe it. Some of the things that I pray for and were writing, I mean, I can see where I was 10, 15, 20 years ago and where I am today. And wow, what a journey God has taken us through. It's nice when you can write things down. History is a good thing to look at for sure, especially in our walk with the Lord. And then he says, um, who lifts my head. He's also our deliverer, right? He delivers us from the battles and the trials. But he also, one of the greatest things that God has done is he's delivered us from death. That's eternal separation from him. That's something to get excited about, isn't it? For sure. And then next thing we see here in verse 4, he says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. David is passionate about the Lord. He, I hope you're passionate about your relationship with God. He says, he cried to the Lord with my voice. He cried out to him from the depths of his heart. And sometimes, unless God takes us through a difficult place, we're not going to cry out to him. Sometimes when life just goes on, everything's good and fine and Danny, I don't really find myself spending a lot of time with the Lord. But I, I want to purpose, like Daniel, Daniel purposed three times a day to seek the Lord. I, I definitely, I make a point of seeking him in the morning. I make a point of seeking him in the evening, of just asking him to lead me through the day at the end of the day, just to thank him for getting me through the day. What, 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 a, what, what a privilege we have to bring before the Lord. Hopefully a lot of other times during the day, I get to spend time with him and others praying and crying out to the Lord. And we see here, it says, and he heard me from his holy hill. Uh, back then, David would go, uh, obviously, to the temple. That's where he would worship the Lord. That's where the sacrifices were made. That was the dwelling place of God. But for us, we have access to God any time, any place that we want to. When that veil was ripped, when Christ was on the cross, and that veil was ripped, that opened up the door for us to have direct fellowship with God. We should abuse that, right, that God has given us. We should, we should use it often. Can you imagine? God wants us to come into his presence often to do that. I want to encourage you guys in your prayer life. I need to be encouraged in my prayer life. I'm encouraged when I see a bunch of people come out and pray together because what are we doing? We're seeking the Lord, asking him to do things that we can't do. Again, Sila is there again. We get to um, verse 4, verse 5. He says here, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. The Lord gives us rest. You know, when you're worrying about the things of the world, you can't sleep. I mean, I told you guys we're moving. I just, uh, for me, uh, I'm, what does Brian refer to? I'm not a hip guy. Um, I, I don't like moving much either. <laughs> I mean, I like things to stay, you know, the way they are. I don't like change, unless the Lord's changing me, of course, which I think I'm going through now, which is a good thing. But, you know, I didn't sleep for a couple of days. I couldn't even eat because I was worried about a bunch of stuff. And, you know, the Lord's taken me through this process, and he's sanctifying me, he's changing me. I think after 40 years, I'd have this already figured out. But he has to remind me once in a while, and I'm glad he did. That's, that's why he's taking me through the Psalms again. I mean, I just love hanging out there because that's where I get my peace. That's where I get my joy, my comfort. It's from the Word of God. And again, he's just, um, when I gave everything to the Lord, guess what? I slept. Started eating again. It was a good thing, Right. And it just didn't, it took a while to get that thing on a regular basis again, and it's there again. I'm thankful for it. But God's our rest. He sustains us. You ever think of what you do when you sleep? We dream. I'm talking to some of the kids about some of the crazy dreams they have sometimes and how it's hard to figure out what's going on there unless the Lord gives you one. But you get, when you sleep, you breathe. Your heart pumps when you're sleeping, pushes blood through your body. I mean, all these things that are taking place, you know, you're, you're growing. Um, all these things are taking place while you sleep. God sustains us when we sleep. We should be thankful for that. Every breath that we have is a gift from God. Isn't that amazing? Verse 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. Now, I imagine 
when Absalom came after him, he brought the army with them. There were a lot of people coming after him. He probably said, I'm, I'm going to be toast. I'm done. I mean, I'm, all these people coming after me, it, it was overwhelming. And things in this life can overwhelm us. It, it's just a matter of fact. I, we get to pray with a lot of people who are overwhelmed. A lot of things we bring on ourselves, but a lot of things we have no control over. We don't have control over our health. We don't have a control over a lot of things in our life. But again here, he, he says, I will not be afraid. I will not have fear. 10,000 people who have set themselves against me all around. Romans 8.31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. I mean, there's some promises in God's word that hopefully when we get ourselves into one of these places that we can bring these scriptures up and we can be encouraged with them. Or we can share them with somebody else who needs to hear them. God's in the business of changing us. He doesn't leave us the same way he found us. I'm so thankful for that. My life was a mess before I met Christ. And I'm so thankful he doesn't leave us that way. Is that He, again, comes in and he's, and he's changing us day by day. Some of us are a little more reluctant to change than others, but God's still going to have his way with us. It's pretty amazing. And then he says here, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. When he comes before him, he has expectation. He's acting. He says, arise, O Lord. Hear me, God. He's expecting God to, to, to listen, be attentive to his pleas and his cry, and he is. He is. He's, we serve a, an amazing God. He has confidence in knowing God. He knows that. You now, you've got to remember that David's experienced God's Delivering them from different trials, from, from pains, just uh, regular issues of life, the same things that we're experiencing, right? God delivered him. And, and a lot of times our past, we can look back to it. We can see where God has taken us. Hopefully we get encouragement from that. Hopefully we get encouragement when we look back and see what God's already done in our life. Sometimes we forget and we need to be reminded. I'm thankful for God that he's got that covered too. He says, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. I guess that's not a very uh, telling them, you know, speaking here that uh, God's taking care of the enemies. And again, he, he, what does the scripture tell us there is that uh, vengeance is his. Vengeance is the Lord. He's going to take care of that. It says you've broken the teeth of the ungodly. That's not a very pretty scene. You see somebody with a broken teeth, it means they got smacked pretty hard. God, God's going to take care of the wicked in this world one day. Again, David says some pretty harsh things about his enemies. He wants to see their end and their destruction, especially those who hate God. And he does say some hard things in Scripture. It's kind of hard to figure that out because what does the Lord tell us? He tells us to love our enemies, to pray for those who, who use us. And, and again, we want to make sure that we are, are faithful to what God's called us to do here. But uh, again, in his, in his trial here, in what's going on, he's uh, crying out to the Lord to take care of these things. Verse 8 says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, salvation is, is something beautiful for us because it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And what are we saved from? Our sin. A lot of people, they, they got this worldview that, you know, if I'm good enough, God's going to let me in. But again, we're all under the curse of sin. Every man, woman, and child that's born into this world is under the curse of sin. And God has offered salvation to some, to all. I mean, Christ came in this world to, to, save, to save all men. And, and again, here, God's going to bring the Messiah through David. He's given him all these promises. He's trusting in the Lord. But salvation belongs to the Lord. And, and again, it's kind of a privilege to be able to tell other people about that salvation, isn't it? I, I'm thankful. I like to, you know, your testimony is probably one of the strongest things that you have as a believer is to tell people how God rescued you from your sinful life. I look back at my life. I don't want to go back to that cesspool. That wasn't a pretty thing. And that's our testimony is that God rescued us from this. He says, your blessing is upon your people too. You know, we have God's blessing upon our life. And David realized that a lot here. I'm just going to look at uh, one psalm here, Psalm 91, verses 1 through 4. That's psalm 91, verses um, 1 through 4. Psalm 91 is just a, an amazing scripture. Psalm 91, verse 1 through 4 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. 
Again, it's in God who the psalmist here trusts. You trust in anything else in this world except the Lord, it's going to go away one day. But again, here is God that he trusts. He says, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He's going to save us from the devil. He says, and from the perilous pestilence, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. It says, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You want that shield that he just talked about? It's the truth of his word. How do we, how do we quench the fiery darts of the devil, the enemy, when he throws them at us? We, the shield of faith. Amen. You know, that's, that's, how we, that's how we fight against our enemy of our souls here. So again, um, I just, uh, the Lord's our shield. And again, that's what, what I, if I had to title anything going into two psalms tonight, O oh Lord, our shield, because it comes right out of the, the scripture here. And he's the one that protects us. As believers, we need to be reminded of that often. A lot of times we take care of things ourselves, right? I'm a guy. I like to fix things when they're broken and take care of them. So there's just some things in this life we can't do that. God wants us to be dependent upon him. He wants us to trust in him. So we get to Psalm 4 here. Psalm 4, starting with uh, verse 1, he says, Again, hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Again, prayer for David was just a habit. It was just something that he did. We have it recorded here. I don't know if he's, I don't think he was praying every moment of every day, but it was a habit for him. When something came up or he was troubled, he prayed. It was a passion for him. Are you passionate about prayer? He says, hear me, hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Are we passionate about prayer? Do we purpose to do prayer? I mean, we can talk about this all we want to, Look, one way to do this is just to look at your prayer life. How much time do you spend there? What are the kind of things you pray for? I'm, I'm sure I ask a lot. I ask for things a lot of times. But just to sit before them and tell them, tell them you love them. I mean, if you have a, a family member, you know, you don't ask them what they can do for you all the time. You, you tell them that you love them. Tell them that you care about them. You want to find out what they want, what, what their will is. We need to find out what our God's will is for our lives, what he wants for us. He brings it up right here. He talks about righteousness. Righteousness is just doing the right thing. Doing the right thing for God, before God, in our relationship. What, is, what does God want me to do? So he's saying here, he's expecting an answer from God. Then he says, have mercy on me. He says, hear my prayer. He's calling out to God. So there's come some time in our life when we want God to really hear what we have to say. We want it to be heartfelt. Dave, with David, it was heartfelt. His prayers were. They were passionate. You're in a spiritual battle, and a lot of the spiritual battles that we're in are won and lost in prayer. As, as pastors, we're called to give ourselves to the word and prayer. I fall so short of this. I think of how many people, this is a, not a big church, but if I sat there and prayed for everyone in this church, I probably could be busy all day long. I know you guys well enough to know the trials you have, the things that are going on. I know your health. I know a lot of things. I, I should be spending, Brian and I as pastors need to be spending a lot of time in prayer because God can do far more for you than we can. And we need to be interceding for them. One of the very first things we, we talked about when we got involved together in ministry is the fact that we would give ourselves to the study of God's word and prayer. And, and it's so important. And if we see things happening in your life, if we see you growing in your relationship with Christ, it's because God's doing the work and he gets the glory for it. Amen? And it's, so, and it's great to be part of that. It's great to see what God's doing in our youth's lives. You know, it's great to be part of that. It's great to share in that. He was clinging to God. He was clinging to him. He was humble before the Lord. He wasn't coming before the Lord. Hey, Lord, here I am again. You know, he wasn't, in, he, he, he was humble before him. And he says here in, in verse two, he says, how long, O sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? Again, he says it again, how long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? People were shaming him. They were making him feel bad about what he was doing. He was a godly leader. He did more for Israel than, than probably any other king. And God used him to do mighty things. God appointed him to be king. He was chosen by God 
As a shepherd boy, he was chosen by God to lead his people. He was a man after God's own heart. What a way to be addressed before the Lord. Here comes the man after my own heart. Isn't that how you'd love to be addressed before God? Isn't that a beautiful thing? They did the same thing to Jesus. They shamed him. They spit on him. They hung him on a cross. They crucified him. They put a crown of thorns on him. They called him a liar. The religious leaders teamed up against him to make him look bad. They tried to trick him. They tried to, de- they tried to bring deception and lies about Jesus around. And yet, he withstood them. He withstood them by the power of God. Most godly men who stood up for the Lord, the prophets, they were killed. Many of the prophets were killed for their faith in, the, for their faith in God and doing just what God told them to do. Because he says here, how long, sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? He's talking about those enemies, those who are gathered around him. We have enemies in this life too. Some of them are in our own families. When you come to Christ, man, that, that's a divide. You say Jesus, that can be a dividing word. It's either going to bring people together or it's going to, again, it's going to turn, push them away for sure. The word of God doesn't return void. It draws people to Christ, or again, it, 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 it hardens their heart and pushes them away. So verse 3 and 4 here is kind of like he's, he's speaking to himself. He says, but know that the Lord has set apart for himself who is godly. Now that set apart there, when, when we think about that, what, what word is that? It's holy. He says, be holy for I am holy. Be set apart for the things of God. doesn't mean we do it perfect. It doesn't mean that we, 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 we're not going to do things, but, but our heart's desire is to do, to be set apart for the work of God, and to be set apart to let God do his work in us. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing here, what God wants to do in our life. You know, to him who is godly, what does it mean to be godly? Um, to, to follow God. To want to, to want to do his will, to be like him. There's a scripture that God gave me as a young, young Christian. Um, he always wanted to succeed a lot of times in this life. But he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Seek after him. Seek the things that God wants in your life. Then be content with what he brings into your life, whether little or much. We want to be content with what God has us. And he says, set apart for himself who is godly. That should be a desire of each one of us, that we would be godly people, that we would be his people, we his sons and his daughters. I hope you guys have assurance when you pray of who you're praying to, that God hears and that he does answer. Sometimes his answers are no, but he does hear and he does answer. I kind of think of some of the things, the reasons uh, why God maybe... uh, doesn't hear our prayers. Sometimes they're not answered. Um, obviously, there's, there's scripture verses for this. David Guzik brought this up. He says, not abiding in Jesus is maybe a reason God doesn't hear our prayers. That's John 15, 17. Unbelief. That's Matthew 17, 20 to 21. Those are things that hinder our prayers. Instead of asking him anything, he said, let us ask believing, right? He answers us. There's times that when he brought up to his disciples about, remember, he says this, they're casting out demons, he says this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. Sometimes that needs to be part of our life too. Brian's brought that up before. We need to be prayerful. If there's hard things in our life, said it doesn't change God, it changes our attitude towards God. Maybe it makes us more sensitive to what he's saying to us. That's Matthew 17, 21. Sometimes a bad marriage hinders your prayers. You know, God says if we, we're, we're not in a good place, we're not honoring one another, uh, that hinders our prayers. And that, that's uh, in First Peter, um, I think it's 3, 3, 7. Unconfessed sin. When God brings something up to your life, go, Lord, that's all right, I'm keeping that one. You know, and, and that's, uh, that's in James 5, 16. Uh, Psalm 17, talks about lying and being deceitful. Those are things that we don't, we don't want to have in our lives because they can hinder our prayer. And Proverbs 28, 9 says, sometimes lack of having God's word in your life. I, I don't know how people can live without God's word in their life. I hear Brian say that over and over again. I understand that. Because when I'm not in God's word, things are rocky. Because it's me running the show. It's not the Lord. When I'm reading his word, the Lord's running the show. Because he's directing me and leading and guiding me. Again, that godliness with contentment great gain is uh, 1 Timothy 6, 6. 
Um, we need to pursue holiness. We need to set ourselves apart in, the, in our conduct, how we, how we conduct ourselves in this life, in our attitude towards things. I, I gotta confess, I get a bad attitude sometimes. I, I, I get off track and it's because my focus is on me again, not the Lord. And in our thoughts, if your thoughts aren't pure, if your thoughts aren't godly, ask God to give you godly thoughts and he'll do that. God's in the business of changing us. Sometimes some things take longer than others to weed out of our lives. Maybe we need a, good, a better attitude. Maybe our conduct needs to change. But God's in the business of changing us. And again, I want him to lead and guide me in this. We're, we're set apart for God. And sometimes we are, this society that we're in today is so distracted. I fight it all the time. Uh, you guys all have phones in your pockets, I'm sure. We all pull one out here and put them up and we'd see them. They can be so distracting. And, you know, just there's so many TV, internet. There's just so many things out there. Social media. These kids, if these kids had a phone, you'd never see their faces. If all these kids, I, I'm so thankful for the parents who've kind of kept them away. Once I see them come in, and I've seen, walked in a group of, with a group of kids watching their phones before, and having some adults in there, and guess what? They're on their phones too. So we're all kind of guilty of that, right? And it's just so easy to be distracted. The things in this world keeps drawing us away. You know, I wish if we were on our phones, Jesus would talk to us and say, get off. Talk to me. Talk to me. I want to, I want to hear from you. But distractions can be really, really difficult and prevent us from being godly people. Verse 4, he says, be angry and do not sin. Now, again, this psalm here, David's angry. He's angry with those who, who are his enemies, who are fighting him. But he says, don't sin. I'm, I'm sure he was angry when Saul was chasing him. But he says, God placed him there. I'm not going to take him out. Let God take him out, right? He wasn't going to take God's authority away to do those things. It's okay to have righteous anger. There's a lot of things going on in our society that are terrible. We see our country rising up against Israel. That makes me angry. Because I know God says in his word, he'll bless those who bless Israel and he'll curse those who curse him. And uh, I, I don't want to be part of a curse. I, want, I, I see things going on. I see people turning away from God, pushing God out of every segment of our society. That makes me angry. And we're praying against those things. And again, those forces are powerful. We should all be praying for those things that are going on around us. We live in a very ungodly society. It wasn't that way at time. God was reverenced. I remember going through the hilltop. There's a church on every corner in the hilltop area. When we were down in that, those churches aren't full anymore. I see the churches around Wright Park and stuff. They're all becoming medical buildings and, and counseling centers. They're not churches anymore. We're seeing a lot of these churches just dying off. It's heartbreaking. It is. And it makes me angry, too. There's a righteous anger. But what do we do about those things? Again, we bring them before the Lord. David was angry. What did he do with his He brought him before the Lord. He didn't talk about the Lord and put the Lord down. Didn't talk to other people about him. He took his anger. He took his issues to the Lord. And that's where we need to do. When we start talking about the Lord in a bad way, that's wrong. That doesn't please the Lord at all. But when we take our, our problems to him, he loves to hear them. He says here, um, meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. He's not talking about uh, Eastern meditation, you know, you know, hmm, he's making some weird noise or something. He's talking about really thinking about the things of God, thinking of his word. And that's what the Psalms make you do. They really make you think about this guy's heart and where he's at with the Lord because he's revealing the Lord to us as he's sharing his heart with us. He says, meditate, and God's a God of the heart. We can put on a good show on the outside, but we can't change our heart. The Bible says from the abundance of a man's mouth. So the heart speaks. So whatever comes out of our mouth is showing people what's in our heart. And sometimes not so good of things come out of it. Even my mouth sometimes, God forbid. So again, he's changing our hearts. He's given us a new heart. He's taken that heart of stone out of us. And when we've come to faith in Christ, he gives us a heart of flesh. And then, and then he, he works on that, and he grows us, and he's sanctifying us day by day. What a beautiful thing that is. And he says, within your heart on your bed, one of the sweetest times I have with the Lord is when I put my head down on that pillow or when I wake up in the middle of the night wondering, why can't I sleep? Well, you know something? I figured that's just the Lord waking me up because I probably didn't spend enough time with him that day, and I get to pray. Isn't that sweet? He, I get up in the middle of the night and I can pray. Sometimes I go right back out. Sometimes I can stay up for hours. 
And I asked the Lord, what do you want me to pray for? <laughs> you know, what do you want me to do? Maybe he just wants to have fellowship. You ever think that God might just want to have fellowship with you and the only time you get your attention is the middle of the night? If that's so, isn't that good? It's a great thing, isn't it? And he says, again, when you go to bed at night, just thank the Lord. Tell the Lord you love him. Thank him for getting you through the day. Isn't that really simple to do? And do it on a regular basis. When your kids go to bed, didn't you tell them good night? When they went to bed, tell them you love them. Let, let, this is a relationship that we have with God. This isn't just a, a motions we go through. This is a relationship we have with God. And you have to develop a relationship. And if the relationship isn't right, you need to bring some correction in your life and get it in a good place with the Lord. And then he says, be still. Oh, my Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There was a time in my life that my life was such a mess and I was babbling before the Lord that I read this scripture and he just told me to be still for a year. And I was. It was probably one of the best years I've ever had in my life. That I was still before the Lord. Nothing mattered in this life anymore except him and what his will was for my life. And it, it did cause me to do soul searching. It brought me to repentance. And, and again, God revealed himself in some of those difficult times. But sometimes we need to be still. We just can't sit still. And there comes a time in our life when God really wants to do some work in your life. And when he says, be still to you, be still. And, and, and seek him and find out what he wants for you. I just love it when God says that in his word. He says it in a few different places. It was beautiful. Verse 5 says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. You know, our call in this life is to trust in the Lord, is to put our faith in him. First thing you put your faith in is you trust him for your salvation. And then you trust him to get you through this life and to take you home where he's promised you, right? You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge him, and it says he'll direct your paths. He wants us to trust him and acknowledge him in all of our ways. Is that what we're doing with our life? Are we just living life big or whatever we're doing, you know? But we need to do that. That scripture verse is a good one to put in your mind and etch it there because it comes up almost every day in my mind. I don't want to just half-heartedly trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He doesn't want part of it. He wants all of it. What's righteousness? Again, righteousness isn't earned. It's give, God gives us righteousness and he exchanges it for our sin. You can't earn righteousness. You can't do that. We give him our sin and he gives us his righteousness. I just think that's a beautiful thing that he does. A lot of people are trying to earn favor with God. I'm a pretty good person. I'm doing pretty good. God's got to acknowledge that. I'm a sinner, and I need to give that to the Lord. And then he gives me his righteousness. What a beautiful thing he does for us. I think God got the bad end of that deal, but we got the good end of it. Amen. He takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. You can't buy it. You can't buy righteousness. He already paid for it on the cross. God gives us his righteousness, and he paid for it already. His righteousness isn't temporary. It doesn't come and go. I remember when we were growing up, you know, you say, hey, that's righteous. Um, you know, it was just something we just said. A couple of people heard that, I'm sure. But you know something? There's no righteousness outside of God. And that kind of righteousness is just temporary. We think something's right, so we acknowledge it. But again, it's eternal. God's righteousness is eternal. God is righteous and always will be, and he imputes that to us. He gives that to us. Just for the asking, just for the asking, he gives us that. David understood that. David understood that clearly. He says here, put your trust in the Lord. Something we can do daily. I mean, I, I, I trust in my own abilities a lot of times to get things done. As the older I get, I'm not as able to do things as I used to. 
But again, I do trust in the Lord to give me what I need to get through this life. As you get older, the things that once were don't really matter much anymore. Dorothy and I are cleaning out our house. I'm finding out, man, why do I still have this junk? <laughs> you know, it just piles up. The things that mattered before don't really matter anymore. And the things that, I, you know, this isn't our home. Our home's with the Lord. That's our home. That's what we should be laboring for, is for our Lord and, and the home that we're going to eternally spend with him. And David really understood that. First Samuel 15, 23 to 23, he says, um, again, what is God like? What does God want in our life? It says, so Samuel said, here it's uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. It says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. That was to Saul. The Lord wants obedience. The first thing you do in obedience is surrender your life to Christ. And then after that, you spend the rest of your life following him. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, follow me. And that's what our life pursuit should be, is following the things of the Lord. He says here, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You know, one of the things that the Lord, your countenance upon us, one of the things that the Lord brings into our life is joy. And so few of us sometimes really get to experience the joy. I love fellowship. I love watching people laughing and having a good time and sharing in the joy of the Lord. I love having conversations about his word. But we as believers, we need the joy of the Lord should be our strength. How do you get that? Lord, you ask him for it. Because sometimes, you know, things aren't, that are happening to us aren't joyful. I love it when someone goes through a trial and I see a smile on their face and they're saying, I'm just trusting in the Lord. And when you do that, that brings you great joy. David had gladness. He wrote these things when he's going through difficult times. He always had a glad heart. He always experienced the joy of the Lord. He expressed his sorrow. One of the greatest sorrows that we'll see in the Psalms as we go through them was David's heart when he fell into sin. And he had broken fellowship with the Lord. That broke his heart more than anything. I hope it breaks your heart if you find yourself distant from the Lord. Again, get it right. Repentance is a really easy thing to do. Some people make it so complicated. Lord, forgive me. Uh, how many times should I say that in one day? Well, as many times as you need to. And after a while, that comes less and less until it goes away. Because those are prayers that God, that God definitely wants to answer. He says, you, verse 7, you put gladness in my heart. Again, that joy that he's put there. You put it in my heart. He says, more than the season that their grain and their wine increased, more than the material blessings. He's, re he's making this as a, more than the, the grain and wine increased. Even though your riches increase, even though your possessions increase, the spiritual increase that we want is that relationship with the God. There's safety in the Lord. And outside of, of, of walking with the Lord, there's no safety in that. Again, peace comes from God here. He says here, verse 8, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Again, if you're not sleeping, I, I used to not be able to I sleep very well. I mean, as a young person, you live on three hours sleep, I think, and do that for years. But eventually it catches you. But when I read this scripture here, he says, I will lie down peace and sleep for you alone make me dwell in safety God God can give you sleep you can pray for sleep and God can give it to you um, and you can work through those things one of the main reasons is we don't have the cares of the world usually when we can't sleep it's because we're worried about something um, sometimes I'm sure it can be physical too but pray and ask God for it I mean he gives us his peace Jesus is called the, the prince of peace isn't he? he gives that title for a reason 
Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. You want peace in God's life? Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. When I see someone that's uneasy, I know they're focused on their problems. And it happens more often than not. You, when you're counseling somebody or not, they've taken their eyes off the Lord. There's something going on with them. They're out of fellowship or they're not in God's word. They're not in prayer. It, it's really important that we keep our eyes focused on, on the author and the finish of our faith, and that's Jesus Christ. It's easy to get your eyes off of them. Again, I talked about distractions earlier. It's so easy to be distracted in our society. We're, we're going 100 miles an hour, aren't we? And, and sometimes it just, just takes a little bit for God to slow us down and to be still and realize who he is. And remember when things are tough or things are falling apart that he's our shield, he's our protection. David never let those things go away. He always kept them before him. That's one of the reasons why I like the Psalms. David's heart, he always kept his eyes, he always kept his focus on the Lord. There was a... The Church of Laodicea in Revelation 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come with him and dine with him and he with me. He just asked this church to repent. He calls, the Laod he calls this Laodicean church the lukewarm church. I don't want to be lukewarm. You put, ever drink a glass of lukewarm water? It's not very refreshing. A cup of coffee is, ice water, iced tea is pretty good, but you don't want to have be lukewarm. And it says, any man hears my voice. God speaks to us through his word. I, I don't, you want to hear the voice of God, open up our Bibles and just read. Um, if you're going through the Bible in the year, I, I know you're hearing amazing things from the Lord, because I am too, and that's above and beyond whatever else we're doing with the Word. There's just some amazing stuff taking place. God's knocking on the door. He knocked on our door once. Thank God he, it was open, and we came to a saving faith, and he's knocking on a lot of people's doors, maybe knocking on somebody's door tonight. You know, he wants to come into our lives. He wants us to let him in. We look at those seven churches in Revelation. You know, I, I want to be I want to be the Philadelphia church. I want to be that church that, that God that honors the Lord and finishes strong to the end. You can pray for those things too. Those those examples of those churches were in the last in the book of Revelation, that last book for a reason, just to give us warnings, to warn us what's going to take place in this, in these last days. A lot of churches out there doing a lot of things. And yet the most important thing for us is, again, to keep our eyes on the Lord, to work on that relationship that we have with God. David did that. He always went back there. God was his shield. He kept always going back to the Lord. Let's go ahead and uh, have a closing worship song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for David's heart for you. Lord, he, that, that man loved you. He loved you. He kept his eyes focused on you, even though his world was falling apart all around him. Lord, you were his strength. You were his shield. And I just thank you for what you did in his life. I thank you for what you're doing in my life. I thank you for what you're doing in the life of these dear saints out here. God, just move mightily in their hearts. And, and Lord, keep drawing us into a deeper relationship. If I have a prayer for us tonight, Lord, that you keep us strong in our faith, that you'd help us to finish strong, that we would get to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servants. Lord, only you can accomplish this in your life. Pour your spirit into us. Do whatever you need to do. D David said, search my heart. And if there's any way that's not right before you, he said, show it to me that I might turn away and repent of it. God, if there's anything in our lives that's not right before you, God, we give it over to you tonight. And uh, thank you, God, that your, your grace and your mercy are always available to those who humble themselves and cry out to you. We just uh, pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
us here tonight go through the psalm so thank you pastor ed for your faithfulness you, also we're you probably heard on sundays after church a little guitar room in there we're starting a little guitar room in there we've got a, a bunch of people in there we got derek and jared and and shana and seth and caleb and and brian and dan and i think i'm missing somebody in the midst of that huh michael, michael yes michael and, and and andrew and uh in that um, we're just uh, looking for opportunities for people in our church to be able to worship. And so uh, Jared came forth at our men's breakfast, and he played guitar, and Shane and Jess played at women's breakfast. And so they're here tonight and able to cover. So please hear me on this. No, no, no. Please hear me on this. Be encouraging to the people in your church. Um, these folks are working hard. I can see it in them. I wouldn't give them an opportunity if they didn't. They're working hard. They're practicing hard. Be an encouragement to them. Be a good word of encouragement to them. Um, and, and help them. Help them. Each one of them, as you, as you see them, they're all practicing in different ways, and they all have different schedules. Caleb's still in school, doesn't have as much time to practice. Some people are working. They don't have as much, as much time to practice. Jared is busy at work uh, uh, supporting his family, practicing. But you see the practice in them. So be encouraging to them along the way. And Amen. we want to see more of them raise up, and, and it's an encouraging place. Uh, Case for Christ on Friday night. That's our, our uh, outreach movie this month. Uh, that's at 6.30. So come, bring a friend, invite people. It's an opportunity for outreach. If you've never heard the story of Lee Strobel, it's an amazing story. And uh, it was just a man who saw his wife get saved, and he realized that she was different. And she was different for one reason, because she had Christ. And that was kind of the message that, that Pastor Ed shared with us a bit tonight as well. It's just with David, when we know Christ, there's a difference in us. And then finally on Saturday at 4 o'clock is the big day for Joey and Michaela. So be praying for them. Be praying for your worship team. Be praying for your church and your leadership. We're praying for you always. As Ed said here tonight, it's our, it's our duty to, Pastor Ed and I in Acts 6-4 is to pray and to teach. But Saturday is a big day for this young couple. So be in prayer for them. And uh, we're excited for that. So God bless you guys.